Uh, how's everybody doing today? I am fan effing tastic. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Lone Gummin Podcast featuring me, your host on Bad Audio, Rob Clark, otherwise known as Big Bad Bob here with you. That's right. Today, folks, and uh, we're going to be getting into... A little bit more on the grassy you knoll. I know you you might be getting tired of hearing about it by now, but these things just can't be reiterated enough. And the more you know, the better off you are. When it comes to being well armed and arguing with lone nutters about various aspects of the Kennedy assassination. So we just passed the 59th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. That's right. 59 years have passed since that fateful day in November 1963 in Dallas, Texas. And we do thus in remembrance of you. Not sure how all the conferences went down. I tried to stay away. Um, you know how I feel about conferences. <laughs> so if I missed anything, Feel free to let me know, but I didn't get any high alert emails that, uh, you know, anything massively or earth shattering or life changing happened. So we'll just go with that. Then it didn't. <laughs> and we'll just keep doing what we do here, which is talking about stuff, bringing things up, asking questions, making speculations, um, and hoping to get a couple more puzzle pieces. To add to our giant puzzle that will eventually paint us a picture of what exactly happened in Dallas 59 years ago now. So looking forward to next year. That'll be the 60th anniversary. And we are creeping in, closing in on the Joe Biden deadline of December the 15th to finally release all the files. Will it happen? I'm going to be <laughs> uh, Mr. Naysayer and say no. He is going to continue to kick the can down the road. We'll get a couple things released. But I am sure there are still going to be some things out there that remain classified due to matters of national security. Just, Just a thought. But I'm guessing that that is exactly what is going to happen. And who knows if we'll ever see everything. And who, at this point, like I said, there's no smoking gun documents. Um, so, yeah. All right. So today, what are we talking about here? Oh, yeah. More on the grassy knoll stuff. So I wanted to start things out. With a uh, couple of things. And, you know, we all know about Marion Baker, um, who made his way into the school book depository because he allegedly uh, saw birds flying off of the top of the school book depository. So he figured. Shots must have come from the building. As if gunshots just don't scare birds uh, from wherever it's shot. But, you know, crack, crack motorcycle cop Marion Baker was on it, buddy, apparently. And would be vindicated by the Warren Commission uh, later as they crucified Lee Harvey Oswald. And their mission to make it look like he was the lone assassin of the president of the United States. 
But Marion Baker wasn't the only Dallas police officer in the vicinity of Dealey Plaza and the School Book Depository when shots rang out, murdering the President of the United States. That's right. No, there were at least three or four other police officers stationed on foot closer to the action than motorcycle cop uh, Marion Baker, who somewhat figured out what was going on despite the loud, roaring noises of these uh, motorcade accompanying motorcycles roaring through the crowd in the echo chamber known as Dealer Plaza. So why didn't these other police officers who were stationed around the book depository head into the depository? Why didn't they follow Marion Baker? Why didn't Baker see them and say, hey, come on, guys, let's go this way? Well, let's see what they had to say about it. This coming from an FBI document stating United States Attorney Barefoot Sanders, Dallas, Texas, telephonically advised Kyle G. Clark ASAC on December the 5th, 1963, that a reporter for the Dallas Morning News name Unrecalled, had advised him that four of the women working in the society section of the Dallas Morning News were reportedly standing next to Mr. Zapruda when the assassination shots were fired. Uh, I chuckle there because his name is spelled Zapruda. Z A P R U D A. Mr. Zapruda. According to this reporter, these women, names unknown, stated that the shots, according to their opinion, came from a direction other than the Texas School Book Depository building. Mr. Sanders also advised that the reporter calling stated that he had interviewed Patrolman J.M. Smith, who advised that he definitely distinguished the aroma of gunpowder down near the underpass. Patrolman Joseph M. Smith of the Traffic Division, Dallas Police Department, Dallas, Texas, on December the 9th, 1963, advised Special Agents Henry Oliver and Lewis Kelly that he was working on November the 22nd, 1963, on traffic duty at Elm and Houston Streets. Okay, folks? This is right across the street from the School Book Depository. How all these witnesses Amos Ewens, Howard Brennan, and this dumbass, Troman Joe Smith. Okay, it's his job to look around, take in his surroundings, look up at the buildings, you know, watch the people. But he didn't see shit. Okay, he didn't see anything in the windows of the school book depository. Or on the sixth floor of the depository. Or even after the first, the second, the third. And possibly four shots supposedly rang out from the book depository. He didn't see a goddamn thing. Okay? Keep that in mind. He says, He stated he was near the parking lot when the shots were fired which killed President Kennedy. Now, we know Joseph Smith, Patrolman Joe Smith, was not standing near the parking lot uh, behind the grassy knoll when the shots rang out. In fact, he was caught in several pictures and film uh, that day running towards the grassy knoll from behind. Um, I forget the photographer's name at the moment, but we know where he was. We know where he was stationed, and we know where he was and and where he headed to after shots rang out. Pictures don't lie, unless somebody manipulated them, which 
I highly doubt. Uh, he advised he never at any time. No, hold on, let me back up. He said the shots echoed so loudly that he had no idea at the time where they had been fired from. Okay. He stated he did smell what he thought was gunpowder, but stated this smell was in the parking lot by the TSBD building and not by the underpass. He advised he never at any time went to the underpass and could not advise if there was the smell of gunpowder in the underpass. He stated he did not see the president when he was shot and stated he saw nothing which would assist in this matter. So what the hell what the hell is he looking at as the president goes by? He's not looking at the president? This is a crack ass patrolman, folks. After the shots were fired, there was a great deal of confusion, and he left his post for a few minutes to go in the area where the president had been shot, but did not go into the TSBD building. So great deal of confusion. And in the pictures, we do see him running across Elm Street. Another patrolman, E.V. Brown, of the Traffic Division, Dallas Police Department, Dallas, Texas, on November or December the 9th, sorry, advised Special Agents Oliver and Kelly that on November the 22nd, he was assigned to traffic and was stationed on the overpass located below the School Book Depository building. He stated he heard the shots that killed President Kennedy, but he did not see the shots take effect and stated he could not furnish any information which would assist in identifying the assassin. Oh, they must have put, put their best and brightest in Dealey Plaza that day. Dallas, uh, you should be proud. He advised that he believed he could smell gunpowder in the air on the overpass, but believed it probably was brought there by a fart in the wind. I added that second part. Uh, he believed it was probably brought there by the wind. No shots could have been fired from the overpass as he was present in this area at least an hour or two before the motorcade came along and was there on duty when the president was shot. Now, what he was doing, whether he was picking his nose uh, or who, who knows what. I mean, there's not a lot of room up there to do a whole lot of anything except stand and watch. Uh, he advised that at about 10.40 a.m., he recalls a green pickup truck, which is stalled on Elm Street near the overpass. This truck was a concern since they needed to get it moved prior to the motorcade. Patrolman Joe Murphy can give full facts regarding the truck and the occupants as he handled the matter and was successful in getting it removed prior to the motorcade. Persons in this truck were workmen who actually had trouble with the truck and were out of the area when the motorcade came by. He did not see anyone remove anything from this truck. Now, this, of course, is the same thing that witness Julia Ann Mercer described when she said that uh, she saw a what appeared to be a rifle uh, in a case or a bag being taken up the grassy knoll and that the driver was a heavyset male, somewhat resembling Jack Ruby. Uh, we'll never know. Was, none of it was followed up on. Imagine that. Imagine that, folks. But interesting that the uh, fella, he did see that, apparently. Um, next, we move up to July 16th, 1964. And this is a letter to the chief of police, Mr. Jesse Curry. Sir, on the morning of November 22nd, 1963, instructions were to uh, make detail at 8.45 a.m., which I did. And then I received my assignment to work traffic at Elm and Houston and also assist in the control of the crowd in that vicinity. I was to report to my assignment no later than 10 a.m. My instructions were from Captain P. W. Lawrence to hold all the traffic up when the motorcade was approaching. I was to assist in handling of the crowd 
and more specifically to be on the lookout for anyone throwing things in the crowd. About anyone shooting the president from a fucking window, Joe. At approximately 11.50 a.m., there was a white male who had an epileptic seizure on the Emplanade, which was between Elm and Main Street on Houston. I went from my assignment down to see if my assistance was needed. After the man was put into the ambulance and sent to the hospital, I reported back to my assigned area. I was standing in the middle of Elm Street from the southeast curb of Elm and Houston Street at the time of the shooting. I heard the shots and thought they were coming from bushes of the overpass. Respectfully submitted. J.M. Smith. Traffic Division. Huh. Imagine that. So then we get to the Warren Commission. And of course they call star witness. Joe Officer Patrolman Joe Smith. So let's see what he told uh, Wesley Liebler. Now they're trying to... uh, ascertain and make it very clear that from where Patrolman Joe Smith was standing that he couldn't actually see the windows of the depository. So Liebler says of the building that is down on the intersection of Maine and Houston, you wouldn't have been able to see the windows at all from where you were standing. Smith says no. Liebler, if you could have seen, it would have been with great difficulty so you weren't in position to observe those windows. And you didn't, in fact, observe them. Is that correct, Smith? Correct. Liebler, while you were standing here and the motorcade went by, tell us what happened at that point. I heard the shots, Smith says. Liebler, did you turn to watch the motorcade? Did you turn to watch the president as the motorcade went by? Smith, yes, sir. I glanced around and was watching the crowd to make sure they stayed back out of the way of the motorcade and also to make sure none of the cars started up or anything. Then I heard the shots, and I immediately proceeded. From this point, Smith says, I started up toward this book depository after I heard the shots, and I didn't know where the shots came from. I had no idea because it was such a ricochet. Libra says, you mean an echo effect? Smith, yes, sir. And this woman come up to me, and she was just in hysterics. She told me, they are shooting the president from the bushes. So I immediately proceeded up there. Liebler, you proceeded up to an area immediately behind the concrete structure here that is described by Elm Street uh, and the street that runs immediately in front of the school book depository. Is that right? Smith, I was checking all the bushes, and I checked all the cars in the parking lot. I find it hard to believe that this one man checked every car in the parking lot. But okay. Superman Joe Smith. Liebler, there was a parking lot in behind the grassy area back from Elm Street toward their traps. And you went down to the parking lot and looked around. Yes, sir. I checked all the cars. I looked into all the cars and checked around all the bushes. Of course, I wasn't alone. There was some deputy sheriff with me. And I believe one Secret Service man when I got there. I got to make the statement, too. I felt awfully silly. But after the shot and this woman, I pulled my pistol from my holster, and I thought, this is silly. I don't know who I'm looking for. And I put my gun back. Just as I did, he showed me that he was a Secret Service agent. Liebler asked him, well, did you accost this man? Smith, well, he saw me coming with my pistol, And right right away, he showed me who he was. Liebler says, do you remember who it was? Smith, no, sir, I don't. Because then we started checking the cars. In fact, I was checking the bushes, and I went through the cars, and I started over here in this particular section. Liebler, down toward the railroad tracks where they go over the triple underpass. Yes. Did you have any basis for believing where the shots came from or where to look for somebody other than what that lady had told you? Smith, no, sir, except that maybe it was a power of suggestion. 
but it sounded to me like they may have come from this vicinity here. Liebler, down around the, uh, well, let's put a number five there at the corner here behind this concrete structure where the bushes were down toward the railroad tracks from the school book depository on this little street that runs down in front of the school book depository building. Yes, Smith says. Liebler, now you say that you had the idea that the shots may have come from up in that area. Smith, yes, sir. That is just what, well, like I say, the sound of it. That was the most helpless and hopeless feeling that I ever did have. Liebler, well, you mentioned before there was an echo from the shots in the area. Smith said, yes, sir. Liebler, probably caused by the fact that there are some large buildings around the area where the shots were fired from. Smith, yes. I like that little thing that Liebler throws in there. You know, that probably caused by the echo of uh, the large buildings that were around the area. And then he adds in, uh, of course, you know, where the, where the shots were fired from. Uh, and, of course, Smith says yes. Liebler, now, did you at any time have occasion to look up to the railroad tracks that went across the triple underpass? Yes, sir. I looked up there after I was going to check there. Liebler, you didn't have any occasion to look up before you heard the shots. Smith, no, sir. Liebler, after you heard the shots, you proceeded down along the bushes here between the street that runs in front of the school book depository building in Elm Street to approximately point number five here, and then when you went down looking to the cars, you then had occasion to look up at the railroad tracks running over the triple underpass. Smith, yes, sir. Liebler, did you see anybody up there? Yes, sir. There were two other officers there that I know. Liebler, were there any other people up there that you can remember? No, sir. None that I can remember. Liebler, but you remember that there were two police officers up there. Smith, yes, sir. Now, you search these cars in this parking lot area down here by the railroad tracks. Excuse me. On from point five here down toward the main railroad tracks that cross over the triple underpass. Did you find anything that you can associate in any way with the assassination? Smith. No, sir. Liebler. How long did you remain in that area? Oh, I would say approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Liebler, and during that time, you continued searching through the automobiles and searching the general area in the parking lot back there. Is that right? Smith, yes, sir. What, Liebler, what did you do after you had searched this area? Smith says, well, it was, I don't remember. Uh, there was a deputy sheriff. I don't know his name. He was in civilian clothes. He said they came from the building up there. And by that time, of course, all the police around there had sealed the building off. And I went to the front door here on the, well, you might say Houston Street side. I and Officer Barnett, and we sealed the front door and didn't let anyone in or out until he was passed by the chief. Liebler, let me ask you this. Before you went up to the school book depository building, am I correct in understanding that you did thoroughly search the area of the parking lot, you and other officers? Smith backtracks a little here. Well, now, I didn't, I didn't go into all the cars. I looked at them, and I was well satisfied in my mind that he didn't, that, that he wasn't around there. Some of the cars were locked, and I just looked into them. Okay. So there's our crack, uh, our crack patrolman Joe Smith, and some of his uh, Warren Commission testimony. Now he does mention meeting a Secret Service agent on the grassy knoll, which we know. Uh, to not have been a true Secret Service agent because there were not any on the ground in Dealey Plaza at that time. And funny that uh, this man could have pushed or prompted Officer Smith in the wrong direction as far as checking cars and, st and things go. So that's interesting. Now, on July 15th, 1964, we have a letter sent to uh, Jesse Curry, Chief of Police. Sir, on the morning of November 22nd, which was on Friday, I made 9 a.m. detail. My assignment was the railroad overpass 
over the Stemmons Expressway, and I got specific instructions from Sergeant Harkness to walk the south catwalk on this overpass and not let anyone on the railroad right away or overpass. I arrived at that assignment at about 9.50 a.m. and where I remained during the shooting and after. I heard the shots, and they seemed like they were coming high from the direction of the book depository building. There was a terrific echo. Respectfully submitted, Officer E.V. Brown, Traffic Division. So here's another crack patrolman who, despite not actually witnessing the murder of President Kennedy below him on the street, stayed statuesquely mounted on top of the triple underpass, overpass, uh, after the shots. As many people were running towards the grassy knoll, he decided he'd be better off staying right up there on the triple overpass. He's good where he is. Okay. Okay. And next, we have a very hard-to-read document. God damn it. Uh, this is concerning uh, W.E. Barnett. Welcome, Eugene Barnett. Yes, welcome is his first name, folks. Welcome, Eugene Barnett. And this is an FBI report from December the 12th, 1963. Um, he is more commonly known as Gene Barnett and resides at something, something Dallas. Uh, residence phone, blah. He's been with the Dallas Police Department since 1956. In the first two and a half years, he was assigned to the patrol division. And for the last four years, he has directed traffic at the intersection of Commerce and Ackard Streets in downtown Dallas. Well, there is a promotion, folks, if I've ever heard one. Here, stand on the corner and direct traffic for fucking four years. Feel me now. Uh, during his training uh, period at the Vegas Club in the something something section of Dallas, he stated that this was during the course of police checks of the club that he knew Jack Ruby. He has never been in the Vegas Club while off duty. He worked for a period of about five months uh, after his training period. And saw Ruby a number of times during that period. He was assigned to his downtown something. Uh, years before Ruby opened his carousel club. And he would, he would go to the club in off hours. Uh, and yeah, I'm sorry folks. This, this document is just too faded to read. Cluck it in the shitter. Hopefully nothing important there. Now, back to welcome Eugene Barnett. Another FBI document we have. Dated January 31st, 1964. Welcome Eugene Barnett, a traffic officer, Dallas Police Department. Da -da -da -da. Advise he is regularly assigned to direct traffic at the intersection of Ackard and Commerce Streets. During the month of November, he worked a 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift. Ugh. Uh, and on December 1st, 63, was switched to a 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. schedule. How would you like to go direct traffic at the same corner for eight hours a day, every day? And you're a cop. Okay. Fuck that. Um, Barnett stated on November 22nd, 63, he was instructed as a part of his security detail in connection with the travel of the president to his station at Houston and Elm Street, Dallas, Texas. He took his position at 10 a.m. His specific instructions were to observe crowds of people for any, any demonstrators or other persons who might appear bent on causing trouble. And as the motorcade approached his position, he was to stop all traffic moving west on Elm Street 
a one-way street until the motorcade had passed. He said officers J.M. Smith and another Smith were assigned at the same location. Barnett said as the presidential motorcade turned from Main Street to Houston Street and came within his view, he stepped from his position near the southeast corner of the School Book Depository building toward the middle of Elm Street and held the Elm Street traffic back. After the motorcade had passed and made a left turn on the approach to Stemmons Freeway, he heard a shot. He said he was bewildered as to the point from where the shot came due to the echoes. But as further shots continued, he conceived in his own mind the shots must have come from the top of the school book depository building. He said he could not, from his position close to the building, see any persons in the window. Accordingly, without instructions from anyone, he raced to the rear of the building to determine if there was a fire escape or rear exit. Having previously noted a fire escape on the east side of the building, noting no fire escape on the rear, he returned to the front of the building and was shortly assigned to prevent entrance of any persons into the front part of this building, and he remained at this post until 3 p.m., folks. Welcome, welcome, Burnett. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, welcome. Hmm. Probably make a great sketch comedy like the uh, famous Laura and Hardy, who's on first, with a, you're, you're welcome, right? You're welcome, yes. I'm welcome, no, you're welcome, no, I'm welcome, no, you're welcome. But I digress. So let's cut to chapter six of Michael T. Griffin's book entitled Phony Secret Service Agents in Dealey Plaza. <laughs> the phony agent on the knoll. Some witnesses said they encountered Secret Service agents in Dealey Plaza moments after the assassination. These reports continue to be the subject of much controversy. Why? Because it has long been established that there were no genuine Secret Service agents on the ground in Dealey Plaza until later that afternoon. This fact suggests that there were phony Secret Service agents in Dealey Plaza and that they were there to help the assassins escape, says David Scheim. After the shooting, Dallas police officer Joe M. Smith encountered another suspicious man in the lot behind the picket fence. Smith told the Warren Commission that when he drew his pistol and approached the man, the man showed Smith that he was a Secret Service agent, apparently showing him credentials. Another witness also reported encountering a man who displayed a badge and identified himself as a Secret Service agent. But, according to Secret Service Chief James Rowley and agents at the scene, all Secret Service personnel stayed with the motorcade as required by regulations, and none was stationed in the railroad parking lot behind the grassy knoll. It does appear that someone was carrying fraudulent Secret Service credentials of no perceptible use to anyone but an escaping assassin. Not only were there no Secret Service agents stationed on or behind the grassy knoll, there were no FBI or f other federal agents stationed there either. Officer Smith was not the only witness who encountered an apparently phony federal agent. Malcolm Summers ran to the knoll moments after the shooting. He related the following in the 88 documentary Who Murdered JFK? I ran across the Elm Street uh, to right there toward the knoll. It was there, pointing to a spot on the knoll where we were stopped by a man in a suit, and he had an overcoat over his arm. And he, he, I saw a gun under that overcoat. He, he, his comment was, don't y'all come up here any further. You could get shot or killed. One of those words. A few months later, they told me they didn't have an FBI man in that area. If they didn't have anybody. It's a good question as to who it was. Well, no shit, Malcolm Summers. But his comments there, describing a man in a suit with an overcoat over his arm. I've seen that picture before, folks. I've seen the picture. I've seen it. So could this picture that is accurately described the description of this person 
actually be one of the false Secret Service agents stationed on the knoll? I'm going to have to go check that picture again and see if we can ascertain uh, who this man possibly was. Very interesting, Malcolm Summers. Very interesting. Lone gunman theorist Gerald Posner dismisses all reports of phony, S of phony Secret Service agents. Uh, says Posner, outside the depository, some witnesses later claim they ran into Secret Service agents. Since there were no Secret Service agents in Dealey until after 1 p.m. when Forrest Sorrells returned from Parkland, could that mean that somebody was impersonating Secret Service agents, indicating a conspiracy? Most of the witnesses later admitted they were mistaken. Huh. And immediately after the assassination, different groups of law enforcement officials, most of them having been there to watch the motorcade from nearby government buildings, spread out in Dealey Plaza. They included alcohol, tobacco, and firearms agents, postal inspectors, officers from the Special Service Bureau of the Dallas Police, county sheriffs, IRS agents, and even an Army intelligence agent. The author has reviewed the 1963 badges for the above organizations and found the several look alike. Any of those law enforcement officials could have, could have been confused with Secret Service agents. And that, folks, is how lone nutters dismiss controversial topics when it comes to evidence in the assassination. Uh, Griffith says, I find this explanation inadequate for a number of reasons. For one thing, the various spectator government agents mentioned by Posner could not have reached the parking lot behind the grassy knoll so quickly. After the shooting, none of them could have been there in time to be encountered by Officer Smith. Good point. Furthermore, although Officer Smith did not specifically say so, it seems reasonable to infer from his testimony that the man he met identified himself verbally as a Secret Service agent. I doubt the man merely held up a badge and said nothing. In addition, Posner does not address the fact that Smith himself later became suspicious of the man he had seen, nor does Posner mention Smith's reasons for doubting the man's identity, explained Officer Smith. He looked like an auto mechanic. He had on a sports shirt and sports pants, but he had dirty fingernails, it looked like, and hands that looked like an auto mechanic's hands. And afterwards, it didn't ring true for the Secret Service. At the time, we were so pressed for time, and we were searching, and he had produced correct identification, and we just overlooked the thing. I should have checked that man closer, but at the time, I didn't snap on it. None other than former Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry stated in 1977 that the man encountered by Officer Smith must have been bogus. I said, Curry, I think he must have been bogus. Certainly, the suspicion would point to the man being involved some way or the other in the shooting since he was in an area immediately adjacent to where the shots were and the fact that he had a badge that purported him to be Secret Service would make it seem all the more suspicious. As for Mr. Summers' account, Posner notes that Summers said nothing about encountering, encountering an armed federal agent in his 11-22-63 affidavit. This is understandable since Summers had no reason at the time to think it was unusual or noteworthy that an armed federal agent would be stationed on the knoll. He apparently assumed the man was an FBI agent. It wasn't until later that Summers learned that there were no FBI agents stationed in the area before or after the shooting. Posner further notes that no one else saw the man Summers said he encountered. However, even if no one else saw this man, this does not prove that Summers' account is false. Nor can we, abs nor can we be absolutely certain that no one else saw the man. The most that can be said is that there is no known report that another witness saw him. Uh, often overlooked in discussions on phony Secret Service agents in the Dealey Plaza is the disturbing account of Sergeant D.V. Harkness. Harkness went to the rear of the school book depository building within a few minutes of the assassination. When he arrived there, he encountered several well-armed men dressed in suits. These well-armed men told Harkness they were Secret Service agents. Uh, it's not hard to understand why the presence of armed, well-dressed men at the rear of the book depository did not make Harkness suspicious. 
Police officers were beginning to seal off the area, and just six minutes after the shooting, Harkness himself identified the depository over the radio as a possible source of gunfire. The problem, of course, is that the men encountered by Harkness could not have been Secret Service agents, nor is it credible to suggest that Harkness somehow misunderstood what they said to him. So there you have it, folks. Legit encounters. And I am going to have to look up that picture uh, one more time. Um, just to see. I might even make it the uh, picture for this episode. I think I will if I can find it for sure. Now, even though we have a lot of these FBI reports and uh, witness statements, it doesn't really, doesn't mean that they were all interviewed um, by the Warren Commission for their report. And, you know, we have significant instances of this, you know, when it comes to uh, statement manipulation. I mean, just look at Victoria Adams and uh, and Billy Lovelady uh, when it comes to trying to establish their whereabouts, you know, immediately after the shots. Um, and, I mean, that that can't be denied. I mean, Barry Ernest found found the reports. We have uh, clear, concise evidence of the Warren Commission, David Beeland specifically, altering witness testimony, leaving things out and adding in things that they never said. So it's not beyond the realm of, of speculation anymore that, that, that this kind of stuff happens. So how much can we really, really, uh, put faith in the Warren Commission testimony of folks when certain things are left out. Certain witnesses were never talked to, like the Newmans, who were th who were the closest to the president when he was shot. How do you not talk to them? Um, and I found evidence of this in March 26, 1964, memorandum to Mr. Walter Craig, president of the American Bar Association, in Washington D.C. Um, he goes, uh, you know, dear Mr. Craig, as I mentioned to you during our meeting late Monday, members of the commission staff are currently in Dallas, holding, taking the deposition of various witnesses. I wish to confirm my intention or, or my, confirm my invitation to you or your representative to participate during the taking of these depositions in the same manner in which you are currently taking part in the presentation of evidence before the commission. And then we skip to the very last paragraph where he states in this, um, with information to supply regarding Lee Harvey Oswald's involvement in the assassination, when I have authorized Depositions of specific witnesses in this area. I shall supply you with a list of the names. Sincerely, J. Lee Rankin. So, I mean, right there, it's in black and white. You know, when I can, when we find people who specifically crucify Lee Harvey Oswald, um, I'll, I'll supply you with a list of names. This a FBI Department of Justice memorandum from J. Edgar Hoover to the Honorable J. Lee Rankin. Dear Mr. Rankin, reference is made to my letter dated April 2nd, 64, which enclosed copies of a memorandum revealing the results of a re interview with Mrs. Jean Hill. Mrs. Hill commented she observed a white man wearing a brown raincoat and a hat, running west, away from the school book depository building following the shooting. Mrs. Hill did not closely observe this individual, did not know who he was, and never saw him again. Paul Hill described this man as average height and heavy build. Now, in this picture in my mind of the person that uh, there was encountered on the knoll and who had Secret Service credentials, who I believe we have a picture of. 
it does appear that he has a overcoat or raincoat, if you will, over his right arm. And interesting that Jean Hill states that she observed a white man wearing a brown raincoat and a hat running west away from the school book depository building following the shooting. Mrs. Hill did not closely observe this individual, blah, blah, blah. Additional investigation has been conducted by this bureau endeavoring to identify this individual. This investigation included a review of all available film taken near the school book depository building following the shooting. A re-examination of the results of all interviews with individuals who are in the vicinity of the shooting. A review of an additional film taken by Mr. Thomas Alea of WFAA-TV, a newsman, and interviews with the DPD and Dallas County Sheriff's personnel, none of which revealed the identity of the man described by Mrs. Hill. Investigative results appear on pages 43 through 49 in this in the report of Special Agent Robert P. Jimberling, dated April 15, 64. This report was furnished to you by letter dated May 4, 64, and no further action is being taken in this matter. So, interesting. Very, very interesting. This man could have been seen by Gene Hill running away from the school book depository. And when he got to the hill, he took off his overcoat to conceal a rifle. And having Secret Service identification simply acted in part and then skittered off into the wild blue yonder, never to be seen or heard from again. Despite furious activity by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI to identify the man. So what did Jean Hill say she saw? All right, from the earliest known statement given to the Sheriff's Department, County of Dallas, November the 22nd. Jean Hill, Mary and I were wanting to take some pictures of the president, so we purposely tried to find a place that was open where no people was around, and we had been standing halfway down toward the underpass on Elm Street on the south side. We were the only people in that area, and we were standing right at the curb. The president's car came around the corner, and it was over on our side of the street. Just as Mary Mormon started to take a picture, we were looking at the president and Jackie in the back seat, and they looked at a little uh, dog between them. It was a little lamb chop thing. Uh, just as the president looked up toward us, two shots rang out, and I saw the president grab his chest and fall forward across Jackie's lap, and she fell across his back and said, My God, he's been shot. There was an instant pause between the first and, 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 and between the first two shots, and the motorcade seemingly halted for an instant, and three or four more shots rang out, and the motorcade sped away. I thought I saw some man in plain clothes shooting back. Everything was such a blur, and Mary was pulling on my leg, saying, Get down, get down, there! they are shooting. I looked across the street and up the hill and saw a man running toward the monument, and I started running over there. By the time I got up to the railroad track, some policeman that I suppose were in the motorcade or nearby had also arrived and was turning us back. And as I came back down the hill, Mr. Featherstone of the Times Herald had gotten to Mary and asked her for her pictures. She had taken of the president and he brought us to the press room down at the sheriff's office and asked us to stay. Okay. That's the earliest report from Gene Hill. I mean, this is, and look, folks, I'm going to be honest with you. There is a lot of story changing when it comes to Gene Hill through the years. But I always go back to the earliest, the freshest memory. You know, before you have a chance to figure, hmm, how can I make money off this situation? No, maybe I can write a book. 
Well, her book wasn't written until the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, she did not testify at the Garrison investigation trial of Clay Shaw. She did not go before or be, was interviewed uh, for the HSCA investigation. It seemingly stayed low and out of sight. It was only in the later years um, after the movie JFK came out in her book and when she started going to uh, some conferences in Dallas that her story got somewhat embellished and changed significantly. Um, but I'm not here to persecute Jean Hill today. I just simply want to know what she saw in the earliest recollections of exactly what she did see before she could have been influenced in her own mind um, by thoughts of fame and fortune and uh, infamy. So, you know, what she does say, saw a man, um, you know, running away from the, or running along the top of the monument there, um, and that she was turned away by uh, police police officers. It was on top of the knoll. Now, in an earlier memorandum, I mentioned that J. Edgar Hoover had re-interviewed, or had Gene Hill re-interviewed, um, and we have that interview. So, in an interview on March 13, 64, by Special Agents Robertson and Tredis Jr., Mrs. Gene Hill stated that after, pre shooting, after President Kennedy was shot, on November 22nd, and after the shooting stopped, she recalled it was then that she noticed a white man wearing a brown raincoat and a hat running west, away from the school book depository building in the direction of the railroad tracks. The following investigation was conducted at Dallas, Texas, by Special Agent Robertson in an attempt to establish the identity of this person. In March 2764, a review of the newspaper clippings of the Dallas, of the Dallas Times Herald uh, disclosed the following information. Patrolman W.E. Barker saw workers in the school book depository building peeking a window from the third floor and pointing to a man wearing horn rimmed glasses, a plaid coat, and raincoat. On April the 1st, 64, Patrolman Welcome Barker, Dallas Police Department, advised that the Newspaper article was an error as to the location of the people tapping on the window in an attempt to attract his attention to a man standing on Elm Street shortly after the assassination of President Kennedy. Coleman Barker stated that the people were in the warehouse yeah. east of the school book depository building, and the man was standing south of this building on Elm Street between the warehouse and the Dallas County office building. He stated the man was taken to the Dallas County Sheriff's Office for questioning and released in, in as much as no basis for any allegation against this person was ever established. No further, or he further stated that the man was taken to the Sheriff's Office some 15 minutes after the president was shot and could not possibly have been the person observed by Gene Hill because of the time lag and the fact that this man was not wearing and did not possess a hat. I believe they're talking about Larry Floor, arrested and came out of the Dow Tex building. On March 30th, 64, Captain Lawrence of the Dallas Police Department advised that a review of his file fails to disclose any information that would assist in identifying a man wearing a brown raincoat and hat observed running west away from the school book depository building on November the 22nd, 1963. Immediately after President Kennedy was shot, Captain Lawrence stated that Patrolman Barnett and J.M. Smith were assigned to work the intersection of Houston and Elm Streets on the date of the motorcade. Patrolman James Foster was assigned to work the east side of the railroad overpass over Elm, Main, and Commerce Streets on this date. So on March 31st, 64, James Foster, Patrolman Traffic Accident Squad, Dallas Police Department, advised he arrived at his assigned station on the triple overpass on November the 22nd, 63, at approximately 10.10 10 a.m. 
and took up a point on the railroad overpass overlooking the triple intersection. Roman Foster stated he remained at this station until after President Kennedy was shot, and he immediately thereafter surveyed the area where he was stationed and observed the area west of the school book depository building leading toward the railroad tracks, and at no time did he see a white man wearing a brown raincoat and hat. On March 31, 64, Mr. Roger Craig, Deputy Sheriff, Civil Department, Dallas County Sheriff's Office advised he was on Houston Street just south of Elm Street. He stated he observed the crowd standing on Houston and Elm Streets, and at no time did he observe any person wearing a brown uh, raincoat and hat. On March 31, 64, the patrolman welcomed Barnett. Dallas Police Department advised that he was assigned to work traffic at the intersection of Houston and Elm. Barnett stated that he was the policeman referred to as being contacted by Gene Hill on that date at the School of Depository building, and he remembers re repairing her cigarette lighter on that date. He stated he did not know this woman and did not know her name, or did remember the incident and remembers observing Mrs. Hill and another woman standing on the grassy slope on the south side of Elm Street at the time of the motorcade. Roman Barnett stated he observed the crowd at this location immediately after President Kennedy was shot and after the car in which President Kennedy was riding had left the area. An unidentified female stated in a loud tone that the shots had come from the bushes immediately west of the school book depository building. Several persons in the area rushed to this spot based upon this woman's information, which was later proven false, allegedly but he did not observe anyone in a brown raincoat and hat running west at this time. On March 31st, 64, Patrolman J. Smith, uh, Dallas Police, uh, he stated that immediately after the President Kennedy was shot, he ran from the intersection to the west edge of the school book depository in an attempt to locate the assassin or establish any other information that would lead to the identification of the assassin. He stated at no time did he observe a man wearing a brown raincoat and hat running west away from the school book depository building in the direction of the railroad tracks on this date. So they're trying to uh, basically prove Jean Hill wrong in her recollection here. And they're doing quite well at it so far. So let's continue. Now, in the uh, re-interview of Barnett, Mr. Welcome Barnett, he stated he fixed Gene Hill's lighter. And he looked here, well, what the hell is all this about? Well, let's see here. On March 17, 64, Mrs. Jean Hill advised that she and a friend, Mary Ann Mormon, were in the vicinity of Maine and Houston streets for approximately one and one and a half hours before the arrival of President Kennedy. While waiting for the motorcade to arrive at this location, Mrs. Hill and Mary Ann walked around the parkway area near the school book depository building in attempts to determine the best vantage spot for taking photographs. Mrs. Hill said she recalls talking to a uniformed policeman of the Dallas Police Department on the sidewalk near the main entrance to the school book depository. While conversing with the policeman, Mrs. Hill noticed an automobile circling the area. The windows of the vehicle were covered with cardboard, and the name Honest Joe's Pawn Shop was painted on the side of the car. Mrs. Hill made a remark about the automobile, and the policeman told her the driver had permission to drive in the area. Just before the motorcade appeared, Mary Ann Mormon and Mrs. Hill were standing on the lawn in the area between Main and Elm. Mrs. Mormon was taking photographs of the motorcade as it came into view. And when the car occupied by President Kennedy was passing Mrs. Hill, he recalls shouting, Hey! He stated President Kennedy was looking down when she shouted, and when he turned to look at her, a shot rang out and he slumped towards Mrs. Kennedy. Mrs. Hill heard more shots ring out and saw the hair on the back of President Kennedy's head fly up. She stated she thought Mrs. Kennedy had cried out, Oh my God, he's been shot. As the president fell forward in his seat, Mrs. Hill knew he had been hit by a bullet. Mrs. Hill stated she heard from four to six shots in all and believes they came from a spot just west of the school book depository building. 
She thought there was a slight time interval between the first three shots and the remaining shots. When the firing stopped, Mrs. Hill noticed that everyone in the vicinity seemed to be in a trance, wondering what had happened. Mrs. Hill recalled it was then that she noticed a white man wearing a brown over, uh, raincoat and a hat run west away from the school book depository building in the direction of the tracks. She said she does not know why, but she started crossing the street in an effort to see who he was. In, in so doing, she ran in front of the motorcycle escort following the president's car and was nearly hit by one of the policemen. Mrs. Hill said she lost the man from view when she looked down at what she first thought was a blood spot, but later determined to be a red snow cone. She did not get a good look at this man, does not know who he was, and never saw him again. She thought the man was of average height and heavy build. Mrs. Hill then rejoined Mrs. Mormon where she had left her, and they started to leave the area. They were stopped by Mr. Featherstone, a Dallas newspaper man, who took them to the press room at the Dallas County Sheriff's Office. Mrs. Hill stated that she and Mormon were at the Sheriff's Office for about two hours and were questioned repeatedly by representatives of the press and various federal and local law enforcement officers. It said the Sheriff's Office was a scene of extreme confusion, and it was impossible to remember what questions were asked of her by the Secret Service agents and FBI agents. He recalled that a man identifying himself as either a Secret Service agent or an FBI agent asking her what she thought when a bullet hit near her feet, raising the dust. Mrs. Hill told him she had no recollection of a bullet hitting near her feet. Mrs. Hill told the agents who heard that she heard from four to six shots and heard one of the agents make the remark, there were three shots, three bullets, that's enough for now. She advised that at no time did any federal agent or other local enforcement officer attempt to tell her what she should say in regard to the number of shots fired or to force any other opinions on her. Mrs. Hill advised that about a month ago, she received a long-distance telephone call from Mark Lane, a New York attorney who questioned her regarding the assassination of President Kennedy. Mrs. Hill stated that from Reading some of Lane's statements regarding their conversation, she determined that Lane had taken some of her remarks out of context, hmm. thus changing the meaning of her replies, had not used her full answers to some of the questions, and had misquoted her in the conversation. Till stated that Lane had asked her occupation, and she replied that she was a housewife. This point was pressed by Lane, and Mrs. Hill told him he did some stuff substitute teaching. Lane told her this was great because teachers made very good witnesses. And of course, they do. They do. And, of course, we know that by this time, uh, Lane was in contact with many Dallas uh, witnesses. And... Of course, he had his own agenda, and of course, this could have pushed Gene Hill off in a direction that she would never, ever come back from, as uh, I, you know, I was reading an article by Peter Whitney. And this is from the website jfk-info.com, uh, Whitney, one. And, you know, just reading through it here, you see that, uh, of course, the Lone Nutters had a field day with, with, with Jean Hill and her statements over the years. And and if you think that I'm being facetious, um, I can go through here. And at the end of the article, Peter Whitman, Peter Whitman, Peter Whitney, shit, uh, gives us sixty eight. Um, inconsistencies 
in Gene Hill's stories over the years. 68 inconsistencies. That's a lot, folks. That is a damn lot. That is a damn lot. For instance, apparently, you know, at some point, um, she was involved in a documentary entitled I'm sorry. Um, not a documentary, but in her book, there's 68 inconsistencies. Um, and I'll just read a few of them here. Um, Jean and Mary were not the only bystanders on the south side of Elm Street. Page 19. Apparently she said that they were the only bystanders, which we can see that they are not in the Zapruder film. Number two, Jean could not have almost touched Kennedy's car by merely stepping momentarily off the curb, as the Alchin's photo confirms, page 22. Well, she said she could have almost touched Kennedy's car if he had just stepped off the curb. Number three, Jean did not see the president driven backwards and sideways, according to her previous testimony, page 22. Jean did sit down along with Mary Mormon, contrary to what she now recalls, page 23. Dean was not necessarily in a good position to see a shooter on the knoll, describing looking down on November 22nd, 63, on page 23 of her book. Dean claims to have seen a single policeman with a rifle behind the knoll who looked suspicious, but referred to seeing many policemen there on November 22nd, 1963, page 24. Dean's claims she went back to the south side of Elm to get Mary after being forced to go with agents to the courthouse, contrary to her earlier statements. Page 27. Jean's affidavit was not identical to Mary's, but 10 lines longer, contrary to what she now states. Page 32. Mary's photo did not appear in the November 22nd Dallas Times Herald, only reference to it. It appeared in November, on November the 24th. Page 33. Even though Jean quotes from her letters to JB, none are provided as documentation. Page 42 and 51, that is referring to, uh, I guess, the motorcycle cop that she had a crush on or was dating or whatever the case may be. Jean is supposedly threatened over the phone with reference to her claim of having seen a second assassin, which, of course, she did not refer to at that time. Page 43, Jean referred to an interview with both an agent of the FBI and one from the CIA, which is not documented at all. Page 61. Jean is asked about seeing a second gunman, but had not made such a claim at that time, 63. Um, Jean was interviewed by the FBI to verify what Lane had claimed during his Warren Commission appearance and not because of his phone call to her, page 98. Jean's interview at Parkland Hospital likely was due to the fact that Spectre found it more convenient to do so, page 100. Nina stated that she didn't know who Connolly was, being new to Dallas, when in fact she had moved there in 62 and was a teacher, page 103. So, I mean, it just goes on and on and on, where he points out 68 inconsistencies in her book, as opposed, as opposed to some of her earlier testimony. Um, Page 67. Dean claims Josiah Thompson contacted her, but he makes no such comment in his book. Page 167. 43. Gene's suicide attempt was not necessarily related to the assassination controversy. Page 169, 172. Gene's refusal to testify in New Orleans could have been due to pressure from her principal and not because of personal reasons. Jean's unstable personal life from the late 60s on possibly could be related to the assassination, but was more likely due to personal problems. Given her parents' divorce when she was a child, her early marriage and subsequent divorce, difficulties related to teaching and other professions she tried, and the demands of being a single parent. Page 195. References made to Jean's serious illness in 78, which possibly accounts for the HSCA not being able to contact her. Her vow to never talk about the assassination conflicts with having agreed to be interviewed by Malcolm Summers for his 1980 book, age 207. So, I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. So, you know, can we believe what this says? Well, 
I believe, you know, like I said before, the earliest parts of her story, you know, are the most accurate. And it does line up with what we see and what we hear and what we know about the events immediately following the shots on November the 22nd, 1963. So, where are we at now, folks? Were there real Secret Service agents on the hill? Dean Hill actually see the assassin. It's a cover picture for this episode. A picture of the false Secret Service agent on the knoll. Let me know what you think. Follow along. At the Lone Gunman 7. On Twitter. Facebook page. The Lone Gunman Podcast. And on YouTube. The Lone Gunman Podcast channel. Make sure you like and subscribe and comment and share and all that good stuff. It only helps. It only helps. And with that, folks, stay tuned. Peace.